So this event is presented by Intercore Library. I'm the librarian, Simon Mead, and our speaker tonight is Cathy Scottwood. Cathy is historian and residence for Dublin City Council in the South Central and South East areas. Now her mission in this role is to take history to the people, basically, take history into libraries, into schools. She's been to men's sheds and residence associations, old folks homes. And Cathy is a social historian. She, in my opinion, she puts the story into history and she always puts people, human beings at the center of history. So you're in for a treat tonight. So please welcome, and I'll let you over now to Cathy, Cathy Scopel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon, for that lovely introduction. And if everyone would just bear with me for a moment while I bring up my screen and we'll start the uh, presentation in just a moment. Uh, just a second now. Now, I uh, hope everybody can see that opening screen. And as I said, it's an absolute pleasure to be here tonight. I uh, hope you enjoyed this. We're going to take a little ramble along the South Circular Road. I'm sure it's a road known to many of you. And I'm going to share with you a project that I did a number of years ago when I was studying my master's. And this was actually my thesis. So I looked at the South Circular Road, primarily looking at the 1911 census details. But be more than that, I actually broadened it out to look at the general history of the road itself. But as Simon said, I don't stop with just uh, inanimate objects like roads and buildings and houses and, and gardens and things like that. I like to find the people in the story. So we're going to meet a few residents from the road um, just over 100 years ago. Uh, in fact, 110 years ago, you'll get to meet some of the residents as we work our way through the story. So let's begin. Dublin, 1911. What sort of a city was Dublin? Well, when you think of it, it was the city facing into a massive decade of change. Things were going to change at a local level, a national level, and an international level. And all of these events would have an effect on the residents, the ordinary Dubliners, the ordinary people of Dublin. Think of some of the events that you would know of that were about to happen, like the 1913 lockout or a World War I, the beginning of, of a, an international war. The Easter Rising occurring in the middle of that, moving on then into things like the War of Independence and even the Civil War. So that's the decade that we're commemorating. But I would just bring you back to 1911. Residents were just living out their daily lives and they had no idea of their immediate futures. So they're just living out day to day as per normal. There's an awful lot written and spoken about the tenements that existed in Dublin at the time. But for a moment, I want you to consider what life might have been like for those on the outer fringes of that dense city, where the countryside met the town, a route like the South Circular Road. When you went over the canal bridges, you were in countryside. You were, you were meeting little villages beyond that. Parts of the city hadn't really expanded that far. As I said, for this study, I really used the 1911 census records. And just to share with you, there was nearly 3,000 of them that I looked at when I was doing this project. So what is or what was the South Circular Road? Uh, and why is it long regarded as a district by the people who live either on it or beside it in the in the side roads you you often find people in who live in side roads such as Reuben Street or Emmerville Avenue and they will use South Circular Road as part of their address where in a country area you might just use the local village as part of your address so South Circular Road although a road going around the city became part of a district. It became a known district and used as addresses. And I let you in a little secret, it's still used as an address by the residents living in those side streets today. Development along the route was somewhat fragmented. Pretty much from the 19th century onwards, we really started to get development on it. And um, various terraces were being built 
along the route itself. Um, and I'll just show you from this one, just to go through the, the various points that are key about the road. It's two and a half miles long. It has a lot of those individual terraces and some pre-existing villas, larger houses that were there in situ for quite a considerable amount of time. The main districts on the route, and this is kind of interesting, are Portobello, Dolphins Barn, which is actually the longest part of the road, Rialto, which is the shortest, Kilmainham, and then Latterly Island Bridge. If we were to look at the electoral divisions that it went through, it's the Wood Key division, that would be the part up near Portobello, ending at what we know as Leonard's Corner. Then you go into the Merchant's Key Ward, and after Dolphin's Barn, you move into the Usher's Key Ward. If we were to define it by parish, which is another way of defining a district, but we've quite a few of them. We've the parish of St. Kevin, that's our first one. Then we've that wonderful one, the real old Dublin parish of St. Nicholas without and St. Luke. Believe it or not, part of that parish actually cuts through the South Circle Road. Then we have the other two very long established ones, St. Catherine, and that would have been St. Catherine's of Thomas Street, but you get a parallel Roman Catholic parish as well of St. Catherine's in Mead Street. And of course, the biggest of them all, St. James, the parish of St. James, which covered most of the Western part of the route. And why would this road have been built in the first place? Well, we'll touch on that in a few moments. And I'm going to, as I said earlier, introduce you to some of the residents along this road who lived there 100 plus years ago. And at the end, we might just look at what happened next. Now, here actually is a map of the South Circular Road. And I have a couple of arrows, a red line and a few circles on the map. So we will bring you through these slowly. As you can see, Dublin is pretty much condensed between the two canals. So this is contemporary, more or less with my 1911 census. So the city is still condensed between the canals. A lot of those black images on the map are either public buildings like the university or there are barracks, military installations in the city of Dublin. And this gives us the main reason why the South Circular Road was built in the very first place or why it was planned in the first place. If you look carefully at the blue circles that are running, four of them, that are running quite close to my red line that's going along the bottom of the map, they're all barracks. So we have the Wellington Barracks, which is the very, very first one down at the bottom of the map there. And here, that's Wellington Barracks. And we move along and here we are at about Kilmainham. And here we have Richmond Barracks off in the distance where Inchicor Library is actually based temporarily at the moment and where we also have uh, the culture company. So the circular road is very close to Richmond Barracks at that point. Moving down and following the straight line into Island Bridge, of course, we have the former artillery barracks at Island Bridge. And then in the Phoenix Park, we have the magazine fort. These are the reason why the South Circular Road was built. Because even a little bit further from them, we've other barracks located at Harold's Cross. And of course, we've the Pigeon House located right at the very far reaches of Dublin City, right on the edge of the city, heading uh, across the Irish Sea, head, looking out across the Irish Sea. The South Circular Road was built as a means of moving either a battalion of men or military equipment quickly and easily around Dublin city, and if necessary, to get out of Dublin city, because the Pigeon House Fort was designated as the last point where if a rebellion was successful in Ireland, they would meet up in the Pigeon House Fort and evacuate out of Ireland altogether. So we needed circular roads around Dublin in order to move men and move equipment. So this is all based in the 1700s, the middle 1700s. And this is the main reason why the circular road was built. Little ironies about it, it's neither circular or south really, 
because it follows to a degree the Grand Canal at one point from which it shares its name. In fact, the canal circular route is called after the South Circular Road. They were both built pretty much at the same time. But when it moved west, and it really is a route going west, where it goes west, then suddenly it takes a dog leg at about Kilmainham there. That's Kilmainham beside Richmond Barracks. It takes a straight route off towards the Phoenix Park area. So the other irony about the South Circular Road is it actually ends on the north side. It crosses the River Liffey and it ends at the wall of the Phoenix Park. So we have this super anomaly about the road itself. It's neither south or circular and it sort of goes west and north. It's just one of those super anomalies about the route that makes it kind of special in the Dublin context. It was wider than most of the roads in the city itself. Imagine trying to march a battalion of men through the alleys and the laneways of the liberties of Dublin. They wouldn't have come out the other end, but you could march a battalion on the circular road around Dublin. You could move them if you had to. And this is a time of heightened rebellion, a time of uh, heightened tensions in Ireland. And we are looking at Dublin with a means to garrison it, controlling it and putting in its military installations at the same time. The Circular Road itself, number one South Circular Road, is actually at Hadesbury Street. It's right on the parish boundary, right on the electoral division boundary at Hadesbury Street. It's not Camden Street, it's Hadesbury Street. And it follows through, as we mentioned earlier, Portobello, then it goes through Dolphins Barn, it goes through Rialto, goes through Camainham, and it goes through Island Bridge, where it ends at the wall of the Phoenix Park. And this is a view of Island Bridge. And if you just look closely at this image, away off in the distance, you can see the thread or the ribbon of the South Circular Road. They're the buildings working their way, just, just attaching themselves to the route itself. You can see the Royal Hospital Kamenum on the horizon as well. And of course, the reason for the route itself is illustrated by the man in the red coat. I think you can just about see him in the image um, to, on the right hand side of the image there. Of course, he's a military man. So this is the whole idea. The South Circular Road route can be used by the military as necessary. And I just think that image is a really, really nice one to put up. Development was somewhat fragmented along the route. I mean, it, 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 it developed at different times and it developed in different places. Um, and as I say, the two extremities of the road actually developed first. Um, Island Bridge, as you can see here, the straight line, that was the idea of a boulevard linking up the military establishments um, at, at various locations, like the military, uh, the magazine fort, uh, the artillery barracks, Richmond barracks, the jail, the Royal Hospital, they're all part of this whole construct. And then at the same time, the route at Portobello was developing in a more residential way. So uh, you had residential pockets growing up along the route itself. The Circular Road Trust was set up in 1763. And the whole, uh, the other thinking was that it could unite urban clusters along the route, such as those at Kilmainham, Dolphins Barn. You, Harris Cross is a little bit off to, uh, off the route, but it, it it, a little suburb of it developed at what we later knew as Leonard's Corner, and then, of course, Portobello itself. The trust was dissolved by 1851, and it's really from then that marks a massive start in development along the South Circular Road itself. Now, as I said, uh, just before I bring you through that gender breakdown, I want to just share with you one particular visitor who came along the South Circle Road in 1900. None other than Queen Victoria herself. And here is the newspaper account of that particular occasion. She passed the Little Sisters, and at the bend of the road, the inmates of the South Dublin Union gave the party a delighted greeting. The carriages crossed Rialto Bridge in the vicinity of Dolphin's Barn and traversed the village. The walls of the Wellington barracks 
were densely lined with soldiers of the Liverpool Regiment who gave a chorus of lusty cheers as the party passed. The fife and drum band of the barracks played the national anthem. At Hatesbury Street, the party detoured towards rack mines. People at all points gave the Queen a spendl vocation. She was on her way to Rathfarnham on that particular day, and that was the route that they took from the Voice Regal Lodge in the Phoenix Park. Ten years later, or 11 years later, here is a gender breakdown and age distribution of the people who were living on the South Circle Road. You see it from this graph. And the curious thing about it is we've a really, really young population living here, but our age range is zero to 96 people. These are the people who were returned in the 1911 census that was drawn up on the 2nd of April, 1911. The other interesting thing is that men are in the majority only in about two of the categories that we have here. The under 10s, that's the, the initial age groups, there's slightly more boys than girls. And the other category where we have more men than women is in the 31 to 40 age category. That one there, the middle one there. What this tells us is that we have a male population attracted to live on the South Circle Road in 1911 for work reasons. And this, of course, is going to skew the whole returns that we have in the actual census itself. Women dominate all the other age categories except those two. So we've more women than men, except in the working age category in the middle. And what jobs were they coming to? Well, mainly to work in the railway in Inchicore, and also to attracted by the military establishment. So we, we have a number of military pe people with associations with the army living on the route itself. The other attraction, of course, was the number of schools that were either on the route or near it. And the different religions that were dotted along the route make it for a quite a diverse community of different religions, different people, all working and living together in a nice community on the South Circular Road itself. It was a very large population too, particularly in the Portobello area. I found that was quite a busy and densely populated part of Dublin. The road itself would have looked like a thread-like development along the route of mainly red brick residential properties and reflecting a diverse group of builders who had been engaged at different times to build the houses here. So you see different types of houses appearing on different parts of the route. And we will we'll just have a look at some of them in a little while. But where did they come from? And this is where it got really interesting. All of the countries that I blacked out on that world map represent countries that were birthplaces of residents of the South Circular Road in 1911. And what you're really looking at here are the fingers of empire attracting people to come back to live in Dublin. We've got quite a number who give birthplaces in Canada, the United States, and a number of South American countries. We also have a considerable number who were born in India. And of course, that's definitely empire that we're looking at there. The Australian population surprised me. And one particular group of them were connected with the Reverend Smiley, who lived near Leonard's Corner on the South Circular Road route. He seems to have taken uh, nieces and nephews home from Australia to live with them in Dublin and be educated in Dublin. So it's just an, a really interesting anomaly. They weren't the only ones, but that's one particular family that were there. Look at the Russian uh, element of our story. And of course that shows us the migration of the Jewish people from parts of Russia at this time and they were starting to establish themselves in Dublin. There's a small population of them living on the direct South Circular Road itself, but the majority of them at this time are still living in the side routes, but they're there and they're beginning 
to have their presence felt. When I started this project, I thought I would find them in greater numbers than I did. I then realized the South Circle Road houses are large. They would be a step up towards middle class. And at this stage, the Russian population are only in either their first or second generation. It's by the third generation that they're actually living on the South Circular Road. So it would be the next census. When we look at the one that comes out for 19, the mid 1920s, I expect that be a massive change in the uh, Jewish population that were living on the route itself. All European countries are represented. Every single one of them. We had, we had um, people from uh, Spain, from France, from Germany, uh, really, um, reflecting this migration of people back and forth, it seemed to have been relatively easy to retire to Dublin um, when you had, say, fulfilled your military um, uh, career abroad and you would have children born in different parts where you were located for your military career. And then you came to Dublin and later in life they were living with you there. The other thing, of course, is the the people who worked on the railways, they were working on the railways in India, and then they came back to work on the railways in Dublin. And again, we find them living on the South Circular Road itself. So it was a big surprise to find such a diverse community if birthplace can be taken as a measure of diversity. And if we look at where they were born from within Ireland, because that's just the if you like the international element that I've shown you, look at the, the counties within Ireland that were represented as birthplaces on the route. And the ones that Martin read are the ones with the highest number of people. And of course, they are the counties nearest Dublin. So Kildare and Meath, and of course, Wicklow. Wicklow was the big surprise package. A huge number of people along the route claimed Wicklow or Wexford as their birthplaces. So it's a really interesting mix of people that come to live on the South Circular Road in 1911. And Wicklow again was a surprise. Can't find any main reason for it, just attracted to live on the route, mainly I suppose for work reasons, but there was no real pattern when I examined it, except for the fact that they were all from Wicklow. And then the religions. Well, when I was growing up, I grew up quite near the Circular Road and it would have been regarded as a Protestant community uh, for my part of the South Circular Road. However, in 1911, the majority of people living on the route are Roman Catholic. And we do have all of the other religions represented. Uh, the interesting thing is in the 1911 census, a number of them refused to state their religion. They just did not return. There's about 150, I think, in my returns who refused to actually give their religion. You can see the Jewish community are beginning to have, make their presence felt, but there was only 126 of them living on the South Circular Road in 1911, compared with the 1,500 plus uh, Roman Catholics. But if you add the other um, religions together, Methodist, Presbyterian and Protestant, they more or less balance out um, Roman Catholic and Protestant community uh, living on the route. But one way or the other, it's still a very, very diverse community that's living here at the time. These are the houses they were living in. And just from that few snapshots that I put up, they're from different parts of the South Circular Road. But when you start looking at the houses, you realise you get this fantastic mix because you have different builders at different times. So you get, for example, a single bay, a downstairs bay, a downstairs bay window, uh, you know, in the parlor, the front room would have been quite the good room of the house, the parlor of the house, usually with a bay window, not always, as you can see with this one, some with more elaborate hall doors, some with a bay window in the bedroom upstairs, as well as in the, the front room downstairs. And then you get this lovely terrace, which is Brooklyn Terrace on the South Circular Road near Dolphins Barn. You can see Dolphins Barn Church there off in the distance. And here is a, a completely unique uh, line of houses called Brooklyn Terrace. Um, and again, they all have just bay windows for the parlour room downstairs. That, that's the predominant style, not the only one, though. You do just get ordinary terraced houses as well. 
by looking at the houses and the size of the front garden, you can actually work out when were they built. So the earlier ones have much larger front gardens like this group that are right beside Leonard's Corner. This is quite near per, uh, Portobello. They have very, very large front gardens. They would be built much earlier. So the middle 1800s, these are definitely from then. But the ones as time goes on into the late 1800s, early 1900s, they have much smaller front gardens. And in one or two cases, no front garden at all. So the front garden was very much a feature, but you can judge by them when houses were actually built. So you get this mixture of large front gardens, small front gardens, houses near the road, further back to the road. And it's part of the character of the route itself. It really lends itself to the actual uh, route. Here's a, an unusual group um, at Leonard's Corner, and it's in one of these houses that the Smileys actually lived in. Uh, that would have been the presbytery for the Church of St. Nicholas without and St. Luke's. You remember I mentioned the Smileys earlier. They were the family that had the Australians uh, living with them. And these are quite unusual in that you have a basement. So more like what you'd see up around Rat Mines, Rat Gar earlier. Uh, they have a, a downstairs, a basement area and the steps up to the hall door. So you, you get this wonderful mix of houses along the route uh, and some are quite different to others. Again, these would be an example of earlier houses uh, put in as the development of Clambrasa Street, which would have happened in the very early 1800s. These would have been built in conjunction with that. And then you get these lovely villa type houses, which predate the route in many respects. This one is very near Dolphin's Barn. It's used as a presbytery for the uh, church of, uh, that's located in Dolphin's Barn Village. And this has been modified. So you've got to imagine that that balcony wouldn't have been there. In fact, that would have been the hall door on the upper area. And there would have been a flight of steps going up to that house. You see that style of house up around Rap Mines. So a big style of, of steps, granite steps leading to the hall door, which was located at the top of the house. So the, the actual main living areas would have been upstairs and then the bedrooms would have been downstairs and at the back of the house. The stairs were removed from this, um, the steps were removed from this house because Monsignor Edward Kennedy, who had lived in this place, he was also associated with James Street Parish Church, uh, he fell down the steps in 1896. He broke his hip and died shortly afterwards. At that time, the steps were removed and the house hall door was relocated to the bottom of the house. So a nice little anomaly. And believe it or not, the steps of that house were found in the garden about 30 years ago. So they were brought back to the quarry in the Dublin mountains from where they had originally come. So carved steps were returned to the quarry in case anyone was looking for some dressed granite. So an interesting anomaly, houses change as events happen and as things happen. And you also, if you look up, I'm always encouraging people, look up, look around and keep asking questions. You'll find evidence of the old street signs. And here's two very interesting terraces up near Dolphin's Barn, Brefni Terrace and Rahoba Terrace. And the old signs are there. How we know that the old ones, we don't have the Irish language uh, attached to them. But funnily enough, Rehobo Terrace actually featured in Ulysses. And it was in Rehobo Terrace that Molly Bloom lived in Ulysses. So you can see that James Joyce would have walked the South Circle Road and picked up on this at different times. So watch out for those old street signs, the old terrace signs. Uh, they're still there. Most of them are still there. If you keep looking, you will find them. Now we bring it back in time. Here's one of the early maps. And in this map, we can see the Grand Canal in the bottom. City Basin located, this is the basin that was originally located at Portobello. And there we have Harrington Street. And here we have our South Circular Road starting. And if you notice quite a lot of fields and open spaces left. The development of this part of the South Circular Road occurred almost immediately after the famine. After the famine, we had the equivalent of Nama. We had the encumbered estates 
And the estate of this part of Dublin was owned by the Singh family. That's where we get Singh Street from nearby. What happened with the incumbent estates was they took the bankrupt estates that had been affected by the famine, both city and country, and parceled them up into building areas and sold them on to developers. And this is where these parcels of land were going to be sold off to builders, including the famous Portobello Gardens, which were located here along the banks of the Grand Canal. And it's from them that we get the name Portobello for the whole district. Hold the image of the city basin in your mind, if you can, this is here, um, because I think my next map will actually show you. There's the city basin. You can see how it was developed as they were building the houses in Portobello. Now, the yellow and the blue line denote the, the separation between the electoral division and the parishes. So what I have here is anything going west of those lines where the red line begins is the South Circular Road. Number one South Circular Road is located right at the, um, the joining of the red line, the blue line and the yellow line there in the middle of the screen off to the left slightly. And this is the map from 1911. And that, of course, is the map that matches up with my census. So you can see from the map taken in the just after the famine, how quickly this part of Dublin developed into quite a densely population, uh, densely populated part of Dublin itself, very close to Camden Street and Harrington Street. They are not part of the South South Road. It begins itself at Hatesbury Street. That is the boundary between the parish and the electoral division. So the South Circle Road starts where that red line begins right there. Number one, South Circle Road is right there, just where my arrow is showing on the screen at the moment. And this is where you start to meet the residents. I'd like to introduce you to the Lundies. And the Lundies lived at that address there. They had a shop. At one time, you can see that building looks a little bit different to the rest. They had a shop that was there and it went around into Hadesbury Street itself. And they also owned the rest of the terrace. They also had plans at one time to open up this area here where you see that gateway. And there was to be more development taking place in the back. They bought quite a number of sites from the encumbered estates that belonged to the Singh estate. I've seen a map showing the Lundy properties. Some of them were located on the Long Lane. Some of them were located further down the South Circle Road. And there was this group of houses here. And they made the one at the beginning, the very corner one, their home, including the piece going around into Hadesbury Street itself. But the best laid plans of man are often thwarted because, as you can see here, both Henry Lundy and his wife Elizabeth died within a year of each other, and they were only in their late 30s, early 40s. They had gone heavily into debt early on in their life with the plan of paying it off in the event then they could raise their children. And the sad thing about the Lundy estate is that the children were raised while the estate was in trust. So Henry Lundy and his wife Elizabeth, uh, their early deaths changed everything for their family. And these are the Lundy family graves located in Mount Jerome. Quite a bit of excitement one day when I was up there visiting a family grave of our own. And there we came across the Lundy graves and the whole story started to fall into place for me when we started going through the details on the headstone themselves. The big attraction of that part of the South Circle Road was the moving tram. There was a tram, tram route the whole length. They, they had the equivalent of the Lewis going along the South Circle Road. And also at different locations, you had uh, some church buildings. So this is the new church of St. Kevin that was built on the South Circle Road as part of the Shannon Fund. There was an actual um, detailed fund of money available in the Church of Ireland to develop these brand new churches. And I have a, a note here that you could have bought a house on this part of the South Circle Road, uh, noted as being a very attractive dwelling because you had the nearby tramway and the church, and it would have only set you back 
200 pounds. So uh, 200 pounds for a nice house on the South Circle Road with a tram on your doorstep and your church and facilities near by. So it, the church building is still there. It's apartments today. Nice to see the building retained. And so it keeps the character of the route and it also keeps the story of the route close to us. Now, have you ever wondered why Leonard's Corner is called Leonard's Corner? I suppose the clue was in the name. And these happen to be my oldest couple on the route. The Leonard's had a very, very unusual shop. You can see the actual uh, awning of it here, near where this old uh, car is located. This is my South Circle Road, and here's the tram trundling by there. If I just go back to the map for a second, you can see a very odd building on the corner. This was Leonard shop and it was the key marker of that crossroads of the South Circular Road traversing the older route of Clambrassus Street at that point, actually dividing upper and lower Clambrassus Street. The Circular Road creates the divide. And I suppose that corner that crossroads is a great example of an urban village developing in response to the new people who were moving into the area. The buildings all around the crossroads are shops, they're commercial properties, and they still are different to the houses along the route. And you can see that um, my John took a photograph of the route today, um, and it has hardly changed you'd you'd be able to pick it out as being exactly the same one so the lovely houses leading up then to the commercial houses located at Leonard's Corner the reason Leonard's Corner developed was Harrow's Cross was that little bit further out across the canal so Leonard's Corner develops as a commercial centre in conjunction with the development of the South Circular Road at the same time and this is a view of it from the other side so we put the two images side by side. You might remember that from my opening slide, the one on the left hand side. This is the lucky thing about a project like this. The tram company took loads of photographs of their trams going through various locations and that's how we get great images of the time. This one I, I actually obtained from the Dublin City Library and Archive. Again you can see the awning there of Leonard Shop right on the corner. Uh, the road has since been widened, but the uh, Leonard shop was kind of halved when the road was widened, but it's still that building on the corner there, the lower image, the more modern image. Uh, busy little um, crossroads, developing like a village, but a more modern village, a, a, a modern day shopping centre to serve the needs of the developing South Circular Road. And it was Leonard's who gave their name to the uh, corner. Now, when we leave Leonard's Corner, and this is where the parish division separates from the electoral division. And what you're looking at in that thread there, the area that works its way between the blue and the yellow, there's another blue line there as well. That is the district of the parish of St. Nicholas without and St. Luke's. It actually takes in the whole route of Clambrasa Street, working its way over the Grand Canal, because the Grand Canal would have come after the parish itself was being set up. So why have you a boundary like that? And that's why it's always worth looking back into the parish records. The boundary we're looking at, at that blue line there, is actually the route of the River Poddle. So the Poddle formed a natural boundary for the parish of St. Nicholas without and St. Luke's. On the other side of um, the Portobello side of the map would be the parish of St. Peter and St. Kevin. St. Kevin was uh, the, the parish on that side. St. Nicholas without and St. Luke's running up the middle. And then the next parish up is St. Catherine's. And of course, here is one of the reasons why the road was developed. Wellington Barracks, previously the Richmond Penitentiary, another um, a prison that was located there. When it changed to being a barracks, that's when all the developments around St. Albans Road, Greenville uh, Terrace, um, Raymond Street, all of those developed in conjunction with the barracks arriving. A barracks was a much better thing to have in your locality than 
an actual prison. So the minute the prison changed, when it was changed from the Richmond Penitentiary to the Wellington Barracks, that's when we got all the building taking place on this particular part of the South Circular. And again, these are that lovely terrace of houses facing the ones where the Smileys lived. So these actually mar would be within the parish of St. Nicholas and St. Luke's. Um, and where the, where the telegraph pole is in the distance is actually where the parish of St. Catherine begins. And there's the laneway. Underneath that laneway flows the river puddle. That's the blue line on my map. I often wonder when the trucks are going into McCann's uh, yard at the back there, do they realise they're driving over a river? And I don't know how thick the road is at that point. That's a little laneway going down the, the back of the houses of Raymond Street. And um, on some maps, it's marked as a rope walk. So you can actually see that they use the river bank not only as a boundary for the parishes, but they also used it for other construction. So it was a straight line. You could actually make rope along a, a route like that. But that road isn't particularly strong. It's over a river. And um, you see the big, big trucks going in, doing deliveries to McCann's building yard. As you can see the sign there from McCann's uh, located at the back of the houses. And someday, just someday, they better not get a really big delivery to McCann's because we could be reading about it in the papers. But that's the root of the river puddle under your feet. History hides in the strangest places. Here it's in a laneway. And of course, when you move on, this old map shows it as the penitentiary, as I told you, that later became the, um, the Wellington Barracks. And we're moving along our route uh, towards Dolphins Barn. This is South Circle Road. Dolphin's Barn. You can see here a cotton factory uh, that was a spinning works and the site of Denor Castle. So we're, we're going through a more ancient part of Dublin here. And of course, the clue Denor, well, that tells us that we're quite near Denor Avenue. So we're moving along the South Circular Road, Dolphin's Barn, starts at Leonard's Corner, makes its way towards Dolphin's Barn. And here's an image of the Richmond Tent Penitentiary. Had a good route around for one. And believe it or not, this is where Daniel O'Connell was once held. And he was told he was being released on a particular day. Um, and he asked if he could wait another day before being let out. And the reason for that, I would imagine if Daniel O'Connell was around today, he would really use social media to his advantage. But what he did on this occasion was he gathered the crowd by sending out word of mouth, get everybody lined up along the route. And here they are lined up along the ancient South Circular Road route, waiting for Daniel to be released. And he's going to be paraded through the city in a very large chariot through his adoring uh, populace around. But look at the state of the South Circular Road at that point. This is why I wanted to get this image. Talk about potholes. I mean, we're talking about the nearly mountains trying to move along it. That's why the road was left undeveloped at that time, because the penitentiary was there. It later became a proper road when the barracks was put in. Here's a couple of other interesting buildings along the route. We had a Presbyterian community. Now the city mosque uh, located just down from um, the, um, the, the site of uh, uh, Wellington Barracks, which later became Griffith College. Uh, now it's, just, it's the mosque. This was the Presbyterian community that were actually relocated as the Guinness Brewery developed. They were originally located just off James Street and they were actually moved up to the South Circular Road um, in the late 1800s. And they built this beautiful church uh, and the manse beside it, and one across the road. There was another beautiful building across the road, very like this one here. Um, and then the Presbyterian community were more or less located all around that part of the South Circle Road. You found a, a, a clink in the, in the statistics when I was looking at them, I found more Presbyterians living in this particular stretch of the South Circle Road. That was fine until I got to Denor Avenue. And of course, just off Denor Avenue, we have um, this uh, church built in the early 1900s. It's the Church of St. Catherine. So this is the church built to replace the Church of St. Catherine in Thomas Street. 
and that was to serve the Church of Ireland community living along the South Circle Road. And of course, today it also has the congregation that would have been in Adelaide Road. And I think St. Peter's are located here also. And you can see here, we have a massive divide between the uh, parish division, which is the blue line on the map here, and the yellow line, which is the electoral division as we come near the Alphans Barn. So this divides the parish of St. Catherine and St. James. And of course, this is another tribute, tributary of the River Paddle. It's one of those little water courses taken off the River Paddle. When we get to Dolphins Barn, right up the middle of the village was the electoral division. And that separated um, Merchant's Key Ward and Usher's Key Ward. Very important when you're looking at the census records to try and work out where the electoral division's boundaries were when you're trying to trace family history. And as I say, the river hides in plain sight. And sometimes we find little clues about the, the, the puddle that we mightn't immediately understand. And this is where that blue line is on my map. So it goes down what we know, formerly know as the Player Wills building. And through that gateway that you see on the left hand image, that's where the river puddle runs. And that's the boundary between the two parishes. But if you look at its equivalent on the other side of the road and look carefully at the ground, you can see the shores. You need access to these flowing water courses. So sometimes the shore under your feet can actually indicate there might be something else going on. And that's why that alleyway or laneway is left there in both locations because the river puddle flows underneath there. No one actually owns a river. They're always used as the boundaries between one thing and another. In this particular case, these two nondescript, fairly anonymous laneways actually are the, the boundaries between two parishes in Dublin. And quite important if we're looking at it from a family history point of view. At this point in the South Circle Road, we get some quite unusual larger villas. And of course, these have military connections. The senior members, the, the brass of the military would have lived in bigger houses. And this is uh, one of the nicer groups of houses are called St. Anne's Villas near Dolphins Barn. And they have these large double bays. They're, they're quite dramatic houses, quite outstanding and quite unusual. And in some cases have nice granite and stone features in their walls, which indicate older boundaries, older field boundaries as well. So you find this lovely mixture of houses. And this is where we meet Bernard Hickey. Now, when I looked at his census return, here he is um, uh, returned, William Bernard Hickey, he's returned as William, um, but he's actually a colonel in the Royal Fusiliers. And it was quite unusual to find him living here on the South Circle Road. And I was trying to figure out why he might be here. But it's, it's just that it was a very high ranking man living in the, uh, the terrace of St. Anne's Villas on the South Circle Road itself. And of course, here he is. Um, William Bernard Hickey, an Irish born senior British Army officer. He had active service in the Second Boer War between 1899 and 1902. But by 1912, so this is the following year, the year after the census, he's appointed as Quarter Marshal, Mar Master General of the Irish Command at the Royal Hospital in Kilmainham. And this is why he's living on the South Circle Road. He's moved in in 1911 in preparation for taking up this command in the Royal Hospital. As he, he has left his active military career, or so he thinks behind him at that stage. And here we find him coming back to take up position in Dublin. Quite an interesting character and wonderful to find him living on the South Circular Road at this time. And beside him is located an unusual little terrace called Dolphin Terrace, and it's picking its name up from the nearby village. And this stone was retained when someone was modifying the wall, which I was delighted to see. So watch out for little features like these as you walk along the route or cycle or drive along the route. You'll actually see these old place names hiding in plain sight. And across the road from uh, Dolphin Terrace, here we have another family called the Parkers. Now they're living in that lovely route that I showed you earlier 
Brooklyn Terrace. So we've William John Parker in the 1911 census, a Church of Ireland gentleman living there with his wife, Kathleen, and his son, a seven-year-old John. And they have a couple of boarders living with them as well. What's unusual about uh, William John Parker is he, he and his wife, Kathleen, are only one of two families living in that entire terrace that actually have children. Whereas before, when we looked at the actual uh, details of the statistics of the route, most of the people living along the route were quite young. But the people who were living in this terrace, only the Parkers and the Elliots, they were the only two families living in Brooklyn Terrace to have children. And Elliots had a strong connection with weaving and uh, had their business actually in Brown Street in the Liberties of Dublin. So uh, the only children were from the Parker family and from the Elliot family in Brooklyn Terrace. And again, luckily enough to find an image from the, um, uh, from the older collections. And this one doesn't show a tram, but it shows a bus, but it's the snow of 1947 and it's Dolphin's Barn during the snow. And again, if you look at the contemporary image, it's actually hardly changed. You'd, you'd recognize the two um, as being of the same place. Uh, the only difference is there was no bus appearing. The 19 bus hasn't, isn't quite as good, or the nine bus isn't quite as good a service as it would have been in previous times. And of course, this is the entrance into the white heather laundry. And um, anyone who'd like to read accounts of what was life like in the white heather laundry, I'd highly recommend Gorkate and Cold Blocks by Amy McTamosh, because that's actually where he worked as a young boy. And he describes what it was like on a day-to-day -day basis uh, going to the white heather to work. And of course, the tram was the big thing. Um, it ran to Dolphin's Barn. Here's the tram timetable or the details. You, because of illiteracy um, in, in the city of Dublin, um, the tram didn't use numbers, but it used images. So you had all these symbols that determined the different routes. And the one for the, uh, the tram to Dolphin's Barn was a brown lozenge, a tri like a, a diamond shape. Um, and the tram was only extended to Rialto uh, by 1906, 107. It had been promised from the mid 1890s. It took a while to get it built. And of course, the reason for building it was Rialto buildings had gone up and there was a new population developing in Rialto. So promised for a long time. Why am I hearing people saying some things never change? But anyway, the tram took a while to get to Rialto. But by the time it did, they always had to put in Rialto and Glasnevin via Dolphin's Farm because the original turning point had been exactly at the White Heather Laundry itself. And there is Dolphin's Farm um, with the church looking much smaller than it does today. The extension that you see on it, the, the, the lengthening of the church itself only happened in the 1960s. So this is what the building looked like originally. There's a group outside the church there. I, I think there must be some sort of an event on. And what's unusual about this image, there's always been a chemist on the corner. Um, at this time, it would have been Mars chemist. Today, it's Bowles chemist is located in that building. This is not a gaslight. This is a fire alarm. And this is the forerunner of the fire brigade station that we now have over the bridge in Dolphin's Barn. So if you had a fire in the district, you tore down to Dolphin's Barn, activated the fire alarm at this point, and they came up to your assistance from Tara Street in the city centre. So we had a fire alarm in Dolphin's Barn before we got the fire station later on in the 1950s. And this is where you cross Dolphin's Barn and you start South Circular Road, Rialto. This would be a small stretch of the route. This image is certainly taken after 1909 because we can see the trams uh, in position. This is the Bank of Ireland. The building next door, there are actually connections of James Connolly. That shop was run by uh, his, uh, uh, his family. Um, and at one time, this would have been a public bar called the Dolphin's Bar, as opposed to Dolphin's Barn, to drop the M. Um, and the family running it, the, the Morton family, were connected with the Pattersons, who actually were carriers. They, were, they, they ran cab company, horse-drawn cab company, also in the area. So just interesting that we're now moving into the South Circular Road, 
Rialto. And here you can see in the older image that you had at this point quite a rural um, random development. Uh, you can see small little sort of village connections here, Poplar Cottage. This uh, Rialto place also goes by the name Poplar Place on other maps. And it's quite rural. We're coming through Dolphins Barn here, making our way towards Rialto. Later on, you can see here then that the whole boundaries mix up. You remember the political boundary running up the middle of Dolphins Barn. And then, of course, this is the parish boundary of St. Catherine's separating from St. James. And in 1911, this is the map from 1911, huge areas around Dolphins Barn and Rialto are still farmland, large farm areas open areas, cottage developments, small little clusters, and then some development along the South Circular Road route itself. The next political division is here as we head into Ushers. So at Rialto Bridge, we move from um, merchants, we move from, um, sorry, we move from merchants into Ushers, and then we have a mixture of Ushers and New Kilmainham by the time 1911 comes along. But I want you to meet another family. Here's the Ward family. And this shows you the different types of people who lived along the route. In 1911, we have Lucy Ward, uh, who's the mom in the family. And Lucy is a widow in 1911. And we know she was born in Wicklow and she was born about 1866. So she's one of our big group of Wicklow people living on the Circular Road at the time. In 1911, she's living in um, a popular place in Dolphins Barn with her young family. She has two of her daughters, Lucy, and it, it appears in the census as Dacus, but it's actually Dorcas, and her sons, Matthew and James. And James is quite young. He's born in 1897. We know she has another daughter because her grandson, Joseph, is living with her. So this is Lucy's family in 1911. I got curious about Lucy for a number of reasons. Uh, why was she widowed? She was obviously widowed quite young. And who is this missing daughter? So I went back to 1901 in Lucy's case. And lo and behold, I find the missing daughter, Mary Ann. But what really surprised me was that in 1901, she was also widowed. So she was still widowed in 1901. And yet young James was only three years old, three or four years old. And I got very curious and found a newspaper cutting that told me the story of Lucy and why she became widowed. Her husband, Peter, but also from Wicklow, had uh, she and herself had come up to Dublin uh, to live because the husband got a job in a distillery uh, down near uh, the Keys in Dublin. It was actually the Anchor Brewery and there was a distillery nearby. So he was working in one or the other. Uh, one time he was working in the Anchor Brewery, which had the deepest wells in Ireland. So this is roughly where Oliver Bond flats are today. On one day, Peter's on duty in the Anchor Brewery and he falls down one of those wells and is killed. And very shortly after, Lucy had baby James. So James grew up never knowing his father, who had died in an, a, a work accident, and Lucy was left to rear the family. The other curious thing is, in 1901, Lucy's working in a laundry. I'm presuming it's the White Heather laundry. And the two little girls, Lucy and Doris, Dorcas, are not living with her. If you notice there from the extract I took from the census, they're living in Inchicore. They were actually boarders in a school in Inchicor, which seemed to be positioned to look after the children of laundry workers. So they were actually in school in Inchicor. It took me a while to find them in the census, but I did. It's always worth persevering. You find out a little bit more about the people you meet. If we move along the circular again, we have the unusual church built by, uh, built in conjunction with the development of the houses at Hardleville and Reuben Street and Reuben Avenue. And this, of course, was the Methodist Church, and it served quite a lot of people who were working in the Inchicore Works. And we have a couple of other villas along the route as well. As you can see, this one, uh, which is a youth club run by the Vincent de Paul today, unusual uh, double-fronted villas. This particular stretch of the circular road gives us 
that type of house. We also have the wonderful uh, South View uh, Terrace, which bookends Rialto buildings, very unusual group of houses built in 1901. And the tram was due any year now uh, when these houses were going in. Then we have the very large villa of Port Mahon House at Rialto Bridge. Again, one of two, because we had Glemalure on the other side of the bridge. They were sort of uh, admiring the bridge, if you like, at that point. And of course, this is where we meet the Flanagans. And the Flanagans are living in Port Mahon House in the 1911 census. And it's none other than your local public representative, Alderman Michael Flanagan. Famous for his son, the bird Flanagan, and we have a pub called after him today in Rialto. And I'm showing you here that his uh, important family grave located quite near the O'Connell Circle in Glass Nevin. Um, the Flanagans, they had a huge impact on our whole area, but that's a talk for another night. And again, we're moving now along the South Circle Road, along Kilmainham, and you can see both the road and the electoral division are joined together. So one part is in Ushers, this side, and this side is New Kilmainham. We have the large St. Patrick's home shown on the map there. There it is. It skews the records for this particular part of the route. Huge uh, older population because it was a retirement home in uh, 1911. St. Patrick's home run by the Little Sisters. They were a French Belgian order. So again, they give us some of our French and Belgian population living on the route. As we move in through Kilmainham, this is, of course, the former St. John's Fair location. Uh, this is Kilmainham Jail, obviously, on the far side. And of course, here is the site of the Hilton Hotel today. That whole area would have been a big, big fairground used by the St. John Fair every year. Um, almost up there with the Donnybrook Fair in, in notoriety, but, you know, still spoken about today. And again, it's at this point that our road takes a straight route across Kilmainham all the way down to the Phoenix Park. And that's where we have the anomaly of the South Circular Road ending on the north side of Dublin because it has to cross the Liffey in order to get to the Phoenix Park. And there it is at so that's another image I have of Island Bridge, just showing you the beautiful Sarah Bridge, which carries the circle road over to join the park. And of course, our red coats, our army men, the whole reason why the South Circle Road was built in the first place. So what happened next? Well, I've given you an idea of who was living there during 1911. OK, I mentioned the Lundies as we're going through. Their money was held in trust after their father and mother died. The children were educated. They didn't build any more properties along the South Circle Road. And you get that unusual feature of an, an, a laneway and on Hatesbury Street, an undeveloped area that is all connected with the fact that the Lundy fortune was ended. The money's held in trust and the children are educated out of that. So the story of the Lundies ended there. In one short year after the census, uh, both of the Leonards at Leonard's Corner uh, had passed away and their premises was sold to Cahill May Robinson, the famous uh, pharmacy company, uh, chemist company. Um, they, they connect their three no, uh, notable families. Uh, one of them was living up in the mountains near Rathfarnham. So they, they actually set up their whole business at this time and buying Leonard's was hugely important to them, a key location. But the name Leonard's Corner is still with us today. We mentioned uh, Bernard Hickey. Um, in 1914, he goes to war and he's actually the uh, quartermaster general of the Irish command. And he's part of the, the uh, expeditionary fort of the 16th Irish Division on the Western Front by 1915. Um, famous, that part, Gilmore and Gil, Gin, Ginchy in, in near the Somme area, that is where the 16th uh, were really, really well known uh, for part, their part in World War I. It's not very far from where the Battle of the Somme took place. 
Later, Bernard Hickey becomes a senator in the Irish Parliament. So he moves with the, um, the Irish Free State. It was very important in, in that sense that we were looking for new people to build our new future. And he's also the man responsible for the layout and the decision for the War Memorial Gardens at Island Bridge. So he is key to our story and a bridge across the decade of commemoration, a bridge from the former days of empire into the Irish Free State. The Dolphin Terrace I showed you, one of the houses in Dolphin Terrace, believe it or not, was the home of Eamon Kant in 1916. And it was from there that he mobilized the 4th Battalion that met in Emerald Square. The bicycles of the men associated with the volunteers would have been lined up against the railings right beside Dolphin Terrace in 1916, part of our rising and yet their neighbor was Colonel Bernard Hickey, uh, who was involved in World War I. You met William Parker, the man with a little boy, his wife living in Brooklyn Terrace. Believe it or not, he worked at the post office. And one day he covered the overtime for a friend. And that happened to be the day that the RMS Leinster was torpedoed just off the Kish Bank in Dublin Bay. German U-boat takes it out of it, over 300 victims. 21 of the 22 post office workers were killed because the torpedo hit the centre of the boat exactly where the sorting room was of the mail boat. They sorted the mail as it went across the Irish Sea. One of the victims was our William Parker, sadly lost his life. In later life, his wife became the postmistress in Dolphin's Barn and during the War of Independence, it was raided uh, by the IRA and she rammed them with a sweeping brush. So she was a formidable lady and um, a, a legend in her own time in, in many respects. But sadly, we lost William Parker in the Leinster. Most unusual uh, connection that we have from Dolphin's Barn with an event at the end or near the end of World War I. And you remember the wards, Lucy, the widow who lost her husband as, uh, in, a, in an accident at work. She had two boys, Matthew and James, James the lad who never knew his dad. I'm sad to report that Matthew was killed in the very, very early days of World War I. And here is the entry in the Commonwealth graves at his uh, uh, grave site in Saint Omer Cemetery in northern France. And that is my hand. I visited Matthew's grave. Um, and you note in it that he, they have the late Peter Ward and Lucy mentioned in his uh, address. So we lost Matthew at the beginning of the war. And sadly, his brother James, the lad who never knew his dad, also joined the force. And at near the end of the war, on the 23rd of November, 1917, at the age of 19, young James Ward is killed. Um, and he was a member of the Royal Irish Fugitives. His body was never found, so James has no known grave. I'd like to reunite the two brothers because there's Matthew's grave, which I had visited, and the a description on the wall of the missing near Cambrai in northern France, which I've also visited, uh, where James Ward's uh, name, J. Ward, that's him, uh, inscribed on the wall of the missing in World War I. In 1916, there are incidents near Port Mahon House in Rialto, and here we have noted that it's the residence of Mr. Flanagan. His house at Portman is subjected to heavy rifle fire by the military under the mistaken impression that snipers were firing from it and much damage was done to the valuable furniture and many windows were smashed. As you know, this is Alderman Michael Flanagan, your local public representative. He puts in a compensation claim for the damage done, not only to the house and the furniture, but also to the cabbages that went missing out of the fields all around Rialto 
during the rising and also a few cabbages that he lost down on the docks at the same time. Quite an interesting piece, he only puts in at the very, very end of his claim, the damage to the furniture and the damage to his houses, uh, not only Port Mahan, but he also owned Herberton House further up the road. A very, very interesting document, quite amusing to think. The people of Rialto were well fed during the rising. I suspect Alderman Flanagan left the gate open and said, you can help yourself. So we know they were all eating cabbage during the rising in Rialto, courtesy of our local public representative. And is that mistaken? Was he really the sniper on the roof? I suspect yes, because his politics would indicate that this might be the case. Here we have Louisa and W.T. Cosgrave. They're both buried in Golden Bridge, right beside Richmond Barracks, um, where the library is based now. But this lady, Louisa, is the daughter of Alderman Flanagan. She's Louisa Flanagan and herself and her husband were married in 1919. Um, and of course, her father is none other than our Alderman who lived in Port Mahon House. So in 1911, none of those people had any idea what was in their future. It was all quiet on the South Circular Road. It was all quiet on the Southern Front. Thank you all very much indeed. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Cathy. That was that was the fabulous talk. And as I said, you, you, you're you really a, you're a storyteller, really, as, as well as a historian and, and researcher. So you make you make history very accessible and very, very human. So thank you very much for that. Thank you, Simon. Thank you very right. much. So I'll just um, we have a few questions here, so we'll just have a look and I'll, I'll put them to you. And we'll just start. Here. First of all, there was a sort of a geography question about the, the road, but then you subsequently answered it with, with one of your maps. So yeah. that answered the question. And we have an Ashling here. Hi, Catherine. A fascinating talk. Thank you. Could you advise me how I might research a particular house just off South Circular Road, 13 Grantham Street? Where would I go to find out who owned it 100 years ago? My grandmother lived in it at the time but I'm assuming her family rented it. Okay, great question. Um, first of all, yes, you go to the obvious, such as the censuses, so you get an idea of who might be living there in 1901 and 1911. So take the address and have a look at the census returns. Another thing that we have in the Dublin City Library and Archive, which is invaluable, are the um, electoral registers. So I have found family members turning up in unusual places by just doing a check on the electoral re register. Now, some of them are online through the Dublin City Library and Archive uh, site, but some of them you have to go into the archive itself, something to do with GDPR and, you know, rules around records. So they would be the beginning. They would be the places I go. Um, I would also start checking some newspaper records. So luckily, again, through most of the libraries, you can access um, the uh, newspapers of the time. Now, you might think to yourself, Asher, we wouldn't find anybody um, connected with us in the papers. Oh, they put everything in the papers. If they didn't pay their dog license, it was put in the papers. Um, I've had comments of my own family appearing about pigeons in the papers. So don't really try that. The other thing is write down everything and keep a track of it. So if you're researching one particular person, keep a blank page after them, put their name on it, what you know, and it will slowly start to fall into place. The final place and the scary place to go is the Registry of Deeds. And we have um, a former library colleague over there, uh, Ellen, and she's really, really helpful. Um, but you, you may need to make an appointment. I'm not too sure how they're fixed in COVID times, but that will track the house for you. But you'd need to be fit when you go over there because their, their files are huge and you're looking at what they call, they call them tombstones, actually, some of their registers that they take down, but they might be able to help you. So there's lots of different places. Also, if you have older family members, talk to them because they can sometimes give you that little nugget 
that might tell you something more than you realize. So good luck with it. Have fun. But I, I know I'm, I'm still learning and um, always open to suggestions and ideas. But that, that was a great question. Thank you. OK, thanks, Cathy. Um, from Paul, he says, uh, wonderful, Cathy. I wish you had been my teacher. <laughs> and then he asks, were, were cattle driven up the road? Yeah, they would have been. Um, but that more happened on the North Circular Road because we had the, the markets on the north side. So you had the cattle market um, located around Stony Batter, up the top of Stony Batter on the North Circular Road. There would have been some livestock along the route earlier because you had farmland, but most of the farmland associated with our area was under tillage. So it was mainly cabbages, like you saw with Alderman Flanagan. Um, you might have had um, more vegetables and things like that. So further out, we get the cattle, but not so much um, around our particular part of town. So yes, but not that often, not that often. Thanks. And then we have Adrian. Uh, what is the origin of the name Dolphin's Barn? Oh, great question again. Um, that's a whole presentation on its own. Uh, again, Simon. Um, it's actually, it, 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 again, like all our place names, if you look at the Irish one first, it's on Carnon. So that gives us a clue there's something else going on. So it's Carnon Cluck, which was a burial mound located almost opposite the Crumlin Shopping Centre on the Crumlin Road. So that was your, your landmark um, area and the area of Office Barn goes out as far as there. So let's get that one out of the way first. It's actually a, a cairn on cluck meant a stony cairn and it was the burial cairn of the Dumphy family. Um, I often joke maybe Eamon might be heading that way at some stage, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but it was the Dumphy family, they had big connections with Newcastle lines. So it's, it's way out uh, County Dublin. Um, the Dolphin's Barn it appears in connection with the Knights Hospital Tours of Kilmainham. David Dolphin is granted land in the area. The barn originally may have been Bairn, a reference to a tributary of the Puddle that came through the area, a French uh, or Scottish word Bairn uh, for, for a river. Um, but then it became Barn when the barn became the church of the local people during penal times. So your code word, I'm going to mass, was I'm going to Dolphin's Barn, or I'll see you up at the barn, i see you around the barn. And they're phrases we still use today um, in the area. So it's a, a penal time connection as well. So where the cross is at Dolphin's Barn was the location of that barn, the original church for the people of the area. Okay, that's, thanks. that's a whole presentation on its own yeah, as well. <laughs> yeah, a lot of history in that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is uh, not a question, just a comment from John. He says, thank you, Catherine, for a fascinating lecture. Ah, thank you and very much, John. A comment from Mary. Uh, Thanks for a fantastic talk, Cathy. Just to add a comment regarding my granduncle, Eamon Kant. Ah. He, he had lived around the South Circular Road for many years. Yeah. After their marriage in 1905, himself and Anya lived in Reuben Avenue. That's right. Which he said had a fantastic kitchen which they rented for two pounds a month. Later, they lived in Herberton Lane. Well, yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Which had a stable and barn among its outbuildings. Mm. Um, their son, Ronan, was um, christened in Dolphin's Barn. The record shows, we have it in the record. Their marriage record in James Street Church is Oskelga. So very unusual. You see it um, written in Irish in the record in James Street Church. Absolutely correct. Uh, they, Ronan was born, I think, when they were in Reuben Avenue because of the Dolphins Barn Church connection. I'm kind of guessing that, but it, it's certainly one or the other. But by 1916, they're living on in Dolphin Terrace. And so a lot of Anya's um, witness statements references that house. And there's a, a, a very emotive account of her leaving that house the day of the rising and going over Sally's Bridge with her mum and her young son, uh, knowing that her husband had gone to Emerald Square um, to take part in 1960. It's a very, very moving account. And well, if anyone's interested in that part of history, her um, witness statement in the Bureau is just wonderful to read, um, but very deeply moving, uh, deeply moving personal account 
of the events of 1916. But thank you very much and delighted they joined us tonight. Um, Claire then says, thank you very much for the wonderful talk. Very interesting. Uh, Rita says, fab presentation. And somebody else says, a fabulous talk. He was born and bred on Dano Road. Uh, uh, Moira says, thanks, Cathy. Most interesting. I was wondering about Dolphin's Barn Brick. Was it used much on the South Circular Road? Great question. The Dolphin's Barn Brick Company um, is really only uh, in operation from about the middle 1890s until 1944. So a lot of the development on the South Circular Road had taken place before that. But some of the lesser quality bricks were used in interior um, uh, rooms, you know, like between one room and another within the buildings. We find quite a lot of it in the tenters. Um, it was used. Um, so they're 100 years built next year. So uh, you find them in the houses in the tenters, uh, an initiative of the Irish Free State to keep men in employment in the brickworks itself. And when some of the shops in Dolphins Barn were demolished for the new linear park. A number of Dolphins Barn bricks turned up in the rubble. They were rescued and brought down to Flanagan's Fields Community Garden and put as an installation in Flanagan's Fields Garden. If anybody would like to pop down there and have a look at the bricks, they're in, in situ there. It's random. You find them more at the uh, Kamenum end of the development and in, in and around um, sort of uh, bits of Rialto, depending on when the houses were built. But the dates are just slightly out. Uh, Sertha Road is, so a lot of it predates the actual intensive um, uh, brick um, production, but it's a little later on. Okay, yeah. thanks. Mm, great question. Um, a few more comments, brilliant talk and natural, thank you. Uh, again, brilliant talk. We do not know the history of our streets. Thank mm. you. Uh, Mary says, who is Sarah Bridge named after? Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, Sarah Bridge is called after the Countess of Westmoreland. So her husband gets Westmoreland Street called after him. She gets a bridge uh, in uh, Island Bridge. Now we don't even give it its name. We call it Island Bridge. Um, but we do have Sarah Place beside it. So that uh, council development of apartments uh, right at the bridge called Sarah Place give us the clue to the name of the bridge, Sarah Bridge. So she's Sarah, the Countess of Westmoreland, and it's a single span bridge and one of two bridges over the Liffey called after women. The other one, of course, is the Rosie Hackett, the Rosie Hackett Bridge that we got more recently. Yeah, good okay. question. Yeah. Mm. Oh, and you says it was a really good talk and you really brought the characters to life. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Noel, many thanks, Cathy. Most interesting. For one who grew up along the road, families from Wicklow, was it because of the railway in Harcourt Street? That's the families from Wicklow. Yeah, I, I thought that too. And I, and I put the question to a few people because that really puzzled me. And someone just, what I happened upon was a an old poison re record register that was held in one of the chemist shops in Dolphins Barn. And I realized then that, of course, it's the trade routes. It would be the journey in and out of town. Um, you would stop off in Dolphins Barn and get a few things. You'd stop off in Leonard's Corner maybe and get a few things. And slowly but surely, the women got to know the shopkeepers and the local traders and relationships seemed to develop. And I'm Assuming that's how quite a number of them, mainly women, came to live from the Wicklow area along the route. Some of them are railway workers, tram workers. Um, they're involved in, um, in, in Shakur, in Shakur works in particular as well. But it, I think it was more, well, let's say it was a little bit of love, you know, and they, they struck up relationships with shopkeepers and people on the route in and out of town and uh, particularly West Wicklow. Uh, anybody coming from that part of Wicklow seemed to settle in and around Dolphins Barn and Rialto. So great one. And of course, we get a clue in Glemalure House near um, Dolphins Barn Bridge or Rialto Bridge. Again, that name, Glemalure, the, the, um, the Byrne family were from uh, Rattrum and they called their uh, house and estate and shop 
Glemmelor House. So that's another one that we have connected there. So it might be for love more than for work. Uh, we'll give them both. <laughs> yeah. um, Philip says, thank you for a most enjoyable talk. Your enthusiasm really added to the talk. And then he says, in the 16th Irish Division, Hickey issued parchments to men who performed acts of bravery. They were known as Hickey parchments. Oh. Current research has established that 569 people were lost in the sinking of the RMS Leinster. Right. Okay. That's yeah, that's the that's correction on the figure I had. Yeah, oh. that's, that's great. But it's the 21 postal workers and the fact that yeah. William Parker was one of them. That's key for our particular story. But thank you very much for that. That's great. And uh, yeah, just some more comments. Well, actually, Connor, were the residents of the road generally wealthier than the average for the time? I think that's fair. I think that's a very fair comment to make. They certainly were what you'd maybe term middle class. If you looked at the jobs that they had, um, there's a considerable number of sort of servants, um, people in religious life, people retired from the army, you know, people who had means uh, seem to live on the route directly because they're larger houses than those located off the route. The smaller houses are off the route, um, except for those in the older houses around the Dolphins Barn area. Uh, so people like Lucy Ward would not be considered wealthy. Um, she she certainly would typify what was living in the village, you know, the village people uh, as such. And she was working in the local laundry and her daughter, Mary Ann, later worked in the laundry as well. So um, it, it depended very much on where. But if you look at the standard of houses, think of those beautiful houses along South Circular Road, Kilmainham, particularly from the uh, the gate, the back gate of James's Hospital. They're beautiful big big houses and they are for uh, people who are up up the chain and um and certainly yeah that that would be true slightly wealthier middle class and um and their occupations reflect that okay. certainly Thanks. do uh Nolig asks would the senator hickey you mentioned be the man that was on the board of brown thomas i'm i i didn't know that um i I, I'm going to check that out after tonight. Okay. Uh, that's news to me, but it possibly is the same man. Yeah, possibly okay. is the same man. I'll make and a note of that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Grant. And the word Portobello, does that have an Italian influence? It I does. Um, I think it's a reflection on the Portobello Gardens in London. And uh, we get a couple of names repeating in Dublin, like Ranala is another one that we get repeated. Um, Vauxhall Avenue, Ivy Terrace, all come from places in London where fireworks displays took place and they're named in, in and around the Cork Street area. Uh, so I think it's more a reflection of us imitating empire. Um, mm. And I, I actually think that's what it is. Uh, it is also connected with the military campaigns. So um, the great battle of Panama, uh, with Admiral Vernon. So we have a Vernon Street in the area. Uh, it's possible to do with that as well. So you know the way we have other roads like Trafalgar Road around the Ballsbridge area, they're all reflections on famous military campaigns were part of Empire at the time of building. So. Okay. And then some more, just some more comments. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful talk from Maria. Geraldine, brilliant presentation. Many thanks. Why did you choose this area to research? OK, um, OK, two reasons. Um, home place. I'm from Dolphins Barn, so I, I grew up there um, and I chose to do the 1911 census because I was looking for something that I could use online for family reasons. I was caring for an elderly parent at the time when I was doing college. I couldn't get out to libraries um, because I had commitments at home. And my uh, supervisor in Maynooth agreed that I could do it so long as I choose. It wasn't a cul-de-sac of 10 houses. It was a master's I was doing. I had to do something bigger. And off the top of my head, I said, well, would the South Circular Road do? And he said, yes. And then I realized I had 3,000 records to look at. So it was a big thesis. 
Um, but that's why personal reasons and yeah. somewhere that was close to my heart. Um, I knew I thought I knew the road, but like everything else, when you study it, you find out an awful lot more. Um, and okay. we say, yeah, I enjoy it. I loved it. Yeah. OK, so there's some more. Thank you. Thank you so much. Fascinating. Very interesting talk. Uh, Rosaline, I have found numerous deeds online connected with Dolphins Barn and my my boardman family. Yeah. And mm -hmm. says wonderful talk, so well presented. Thank you, Kathy. What is the name of the book you mentioned? Um, I the thesis itself was turned into a book, um, which is the South Circular Road on the Eve of World War One. Uh, it was published by the Minute series. It is available in secondhand shops and on Amazon and places like that at the moment. I think the public libraries have it as well. Um, so if anybody wanted to read that, but it was also an abridged version of this presentation was published by the Old Dublin Society in their Dublin Historical Journal a couple of years ago. And I was awarded the silver medal for the research. So it's something that I was lucky because the 1911 hadn't really been looked at like this by many people so I had free reign with it and I just tried to look at it and I only looked at the front page of every census return so um, I was lucky then to get it published in two different formats so it was uh, published by the Minute series so that's actually I know to look back to front but that's actually it um, if anybody wants to source it and I think it can be sourced through the library service as well. Okay thanks. Yeah. Um, Patsy says, wonderful talk, made me long to be in Dublin and not exiled in Galway. <laughs> <laughs> My grandparents were married in Harrington Street. Ah, oh, very good. Yeah. Uh, Michelle says, thank you so much. Great to listen to someone so knowledgeable and also enthusiastic. And Paul says, Cathy, is, is there a 1798 connection with Dolphins Barn? Uh, yes, there is. Uh, the um, yeomanry had a barracks at Dolphins Barn. It was set on fire during the 1798 rebellion. And by 1801 or two, the British military have installed a harbour at Dolphins Barn to deal with any future rebellion using the canal. So it's the closest spot they could get. So you could literally unload your military at Dolphins Barn at a harbour and they could head into the city. Uh, the excavated ground from that harbour was used to create the Quaker graveyard in Cork Street. And the back that harbour more recently became the beer garden for a public house at Toppas Barn Bridge during the, um, the lockdown when we had to go outdoors for our summer. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's at the back of the, the pub at Office Barn Bridge. So okay. yeah, uh, you see, when I go up that area, I'm back in either 1911 the 1850s or back in 1798. I'm not in the real world at all. So um, you can still see evidence of the older times there, but that's the bit I know of for 1798 and later on. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. And more comments. Amazing talk. One of the best talks I've ever heard. Oh. And hi, Kathy. Great presentation. Wonderful history talk. Thank you. And uh, Una, thank you, Kathy, for a great account of the area. And Jim says, great talk. I have no connection with Dublin, but really learned a lot. I can understand how people return from India, etc. Mm -hmm. what, what brought South Americans to the road? Um, I think some of them would, they wouldn't have been, they may have been born there as children. So it was probably um, a certain element of being sent over by Empire to build railways, um, canal building, military, it, these seem to be the main uh, links that I could find. So they're, they're from all over the world, but there was a considerable number that had children born in India and a considerable number that had children obviously born in Scotland and England. And then those places went, there was one particular family and they seemed to have a child born in every port. You know, they, they you could nearly track his military um, a campaign by the children who where they were born. So he had one born in Gibraltar, for example, and someone born in India. You know, you could pick them out mm. that way. So it's all tied in with railway engineering, you know, that high end engineering that's very much to the fore at this particular time. And then they seem to come, they have enough money from that 
work to come and live in, Duff, in, in and around the South Circular Road then in, um, in retirement in some cases or drawn back to the area as consultants maybe in the Inchicore Works, in the brewery, um, in the distilleries, all the big, big employers in the area. Okay, uh, lots of thank yous. And then a question from Noel. Kevin Barry lived in, he thinks 51 South Circular. Uh, did he live rent in a house along the road? I was told it was where Dowling's shop was at Leonard's Corner. Okay, that might very well be the case, but um, I knew his residence, certainly his father and mother's residence was in Fleet Street uh, above Healy's shop. Uh, so it would have been opposite the old ESB buildings in Fleet Street. There's a connection somehow with Mead Street as well, because his, his um, image appears on one of the pillars in Mead Street Church. Um, there were medical students living on the South Circular Road at that end. And funny enough, 51 seems to ring a bell with me, um, but his name didn't come up. I don't remember his name appearing in the 11th census. I'm pretty sure I would have picked it up uh, when I was going through them. But I stand totally to be corrected. And it just depends. Always remember the census is a snapshot of one day in one year. It, 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 he could have moved in a couple of months later and uh, have been living there. But th that was, there the evidence of the 2nd of April, 1911. So that's all I could work from, from that. Okay. Uh, question, uh, can I contact Cathy by emailing Inchicore Library? So, Simon, if you're happy, yeah, yeah happy yeah, enough absolutely. with that, no problem at all, yeah, yeah. yeah email is uh, Inchicore Library at dublincity.ie. Inchicore Library at dublincity.ie. Okay. Somebody says the price of houses in SCR will go up after you talk. After you talk. <laughs> <laughs> or down. <laughs> Kathy, um, Jerry says, thanks, Cathy. Excellent. Do you know anything about the large house on Kilmainham End? Oops, uh, that's just been obscured for a second. Do you know anything about the large house on Kilmainham End called St. James's? It used to house, it used to house the Varnon Brush Factory, I think. The Varian Brush Company, yeah. The Varian oh. Brush Company were located in behind the South Circle Road, Kilmainham. Um, if, that, that, if it's the same house I'm thinking of, the one thing I do know about it is uh, the gate, the gate post on the front of that house is actually a 1798 pike. Uh, it's, part, it's part of the ironwork of the front of the house. Um, and I think the, the clue might be in the name St. James, because that would be the furthest reach of the parish of St. James, um, because after that you have St. Michael's and Golden Bridge, you know, it would have um, stretched out from there. So it may have had a connection with the parish, but I'm not 100% certain. But the one thing I do know about the house is the gate, the very unusual gate it has with a 1798 pike uh, incorporated into the ironwork. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So that's it. That's okay. the end of the questions. Um, so again, I'd like to thank Cathy very, very much for such an interesting talk. It's always so informative as usual and you're so full of enthusiasm. Again, as I say, you make it all very accessible and, and very, very enjoyable. 